Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Brandon Elliott. Brandon, welcome to the show. What's up, Robert? I appreciate you having me, man. I'm excited to be here. You have a lot of different things going on, but help me set the stage for everyone listening today by telling us a bit about yourself and a quick overview that we'll dive into deeper later about how you went from being on house arrest to $5 million net worth. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a crazy long story. So I won't bore everyone with it, but, um, but long story short, I'm from New Jersey. Originally I live out in sunny San Diego, California, fell in love with it out here. Uh, I was doing, I, I grew up a screw up, got into drugs and stupid stuff and was selling uh, weed, big pothead back in the day and um, ended up having an explosion, burnt 40% of my body. Uh, I was on fire. And um, so they induced me to, into a coma for a week. Um, three surgeries later, a month in the hospital, had to learn how to walk again. And, um, and you know, court stuff uh, pending. So it was just a crazy experience. Years later, I got house arrest and I started improving my life and changing things around. So um, I got introduced to real estate from, I, I was a good salesperson and, and door knocking uh, for Kirby vacuum cleaners out here in, in San Diego. And I got recruited into a uh, real estate investment company that I got a little bit of education, but a hell of a lot more motivation. Like I saw the, the system in place and I saw how we were making a bigger impact in people's lives. I saw how everybody was getting paid well in the, in the company and it was just really inspiring. So I started doing my own education with all the books, podcasts, just like this and YouTube, because I wasn't smart enough to know that there was mentors out there to help me. <laughs> and, uh, and eventually I ended up finding myself investing 3000 miles away over in Ohio. Um, because all the deals that I, I, I submitted 30 plus offers out here in two years in San Diego and, uh, going against real investors that offer, you know, all cash, no contingencies and close in 10 days, stuff that we do now. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of funny. I just couldn't get in, you know, out here, but Ohio, I was able to, I ended up, uh, I was working restaurant jobs at the time. So I really didn't have that much money saved up. I had 35,000, but I, I had good credit and I was able to get creative. You know, when there's a will, there's a way. And I got creative and I figured out, okay, let's, you know, let's see if I can use my credit to actually be able to purchase properties and complete the remodels. And, and it turned into just a whole credit business over, over the years, but we purchased properties with credit cards. I've um, done all my remodels with credit cards. So I get a nice vacation at the end of each remodel. And I don't get screwed over by contractors, which is amazing uh, because it's on a credit card. And we've done private money lending, hard money lending. We started a mastermind group called Credit Council Elite, which has helped people in so many different ways, fix credit very quickly, build up millions in personal and business lines of credit, and then leveraging it into e-com stores, real estate, you name it, bunch of fun stuff. What was that first real estate company doing? Like what kind of real estate were they into? Was it a private equity firm doing these big apartment buildings or what did it look like? No, no, it was, it was back in 2012. Uh, so it was NODs, um, notice of defaults, a lot of pre foreclosure stuff back then. Um, you know, right after the crash, several years later, people were just, you know, trying to get modifications and so forth. So, um, I, they needed door knockers. They needed people, you know, we had these huge lists that everybody was going to foreclosure soon and, and so forth and getting all these notices. So, uh, they gave me this list and I drove around knocking on doors, trying to see if, Hey, do you guys have a modification? Do you guys have something, a backup plan? Because it's going to auction in a week from today, you know, and if not, we could be your backup plan and, make it a win-win situation. So it doesn't go to auction, it doesn't mess up your credit and you guys can actually get paid instead of just losing it. What was that company doing if they didn't have any backup plan? How were they being the fix for them? Uh, so we had multiple strategies because we had uh, agents as well on the team. So if they didn't want to actually sell it to us uh, as a, at a discount, then we could list it for them and try to sell it on the market or uh, set them up with a modification, uh, another T 
team section um, within the company could set them up with a modification so that they could stay longer if that was truly their goal. But back then, a lot of the modifications really weren't even working that that well, uh, or they they were misguided. I feel like a lot of people thought it was the the one and done, you know, simple trick that they needed, but there, there's a lot more to it. When you started to invest yourself, why did you choose Ohio? I, I understand long distance. I'm a long distance investor myself. That's my okay. number one strategy. So I totally understand why you chose to go long distance, but I mean, there's 49 other states other than California, right? So why did you yeah. choose Ohio? Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, I feel like it's like a God thing, honestly, because I, I was trying out here for two years, couldn't get like any offers accepted. I started getting more desperate and like started submitting on deals that weren't even really a deal. Like it really wouldn't work out number wise, but I was like, screw it. I, I just want to get started two years and I'm impatient, you know, like all millennials, I feel like, but, um, but needless to say, I started looking in other states, you know, like Arizona is right next door. So I looked there first and then I started looking in Texas and then I'm from New Jersey. So I checked out New Jersey and just truth be told, um, it was probably my lack of education, honestly, at the time, but instantly I, I wasn't finding as I was doing the due diligence on the location and properties in the area, I couldn't find something that was like really cash flowing and that it truly made sense. But I got uh, recommended by three different people all within the same week and uh, to check out Ohio. So when I did that, all of Ohio, I was, you know, doing my due diligence on and most of it cash flowed in many different ways. So I found this, uh, this lucrative opportunity that it had a uh, job growth, population growth, and then something unique about it that, that actually turned me on to like, Hey, I think this is the location. So I started building the relationships, but the unique part was really a famous Catholic university that they just announced the, the semester before that they didn't have enough housing available for the students. So juniors and seniors had to find off-campus housing. And that was like, you know, that was like that, that light bulb moment. And once I started doing more due diligence, I found out like there was a lot of bigger investors there, old guys that had a ton of properties in like their early nineties that like, they just wanted to cash out. So they were creating more of a, a buyer's opportunity for, for me. Did you end up going into student rentals because of that university needing needing housing? It wasn't intentional, but it it turned out to be that way. Like I'll I'll run out to anybody. We have uh, a good amount of Section Eight as well, but um, but yeah, we we have several students, and yeah, it just turned out that way. Have you decided to go into student rentals more after that experience, or have you just kind of again, like you said, take anybody that's qualified to rent your your places? Yeah. So I, I screen very tough, just like a bank would, uh, <laughs> just to, you know, like, I'd rather have a vacancy for a long time. Like some people are like, dang, I can't believe you're having a vacancy this long, but I'd rather have it that way so that I can get the cream of the crop instead of somebody that is going to potentially damage or just be a headache to me. So, um, I've noticed that the students, as long as I screen well, and then they, almost find their replacements and I give them incentives to do so, then, um, then it typically works out well. But I've also had some young guys that they kind of want to party a little bit. And I'm like, dang, how do I, how do I let you guys slip through the cracks here? Um, but they're all pretty respectful at the end of the day. Section eight, I'm starting to find out is just more, as long as I find the right, like good tenants that aren't going to trash the home and, and they're respectful. Section eight has been kind of that bread and butter of like, I'm starting to like this because we can really get top dollar. When you do the student rentals, do you put the parents on the lease as well as like a co-signer? Sometimes we do. Yeah, we've done this several times. If if they don't have uh, their own income and like parents are paying for it, then definitely. Um, if if their credit, if they're very young and this is like their first time um, living on their own, then yeah. You know, there, there's a bunch of little things that will, uh, yeah, I, I just screen hard. So a lot of them will end up having to have their parents. How have student rentals performed over the last year or two with COVID? Yeah, that's a great question. 
Um, because the school in general, like they, they did close up for a while. So, um, there were several students that were, uh, you know, going back home and so forth. And I, I'm very blessed, you know, we, we haven't had any vacancies or anything related to COVID that, um, that restricted us or held us back. Um, we've had one tenant that tried, uh, tried playing some games a little bit during COVID of not paying rent and then kind of rubbing it in our face. Like, you know, you can't even evict me. Um, but Ohio is different over there and they didn't realize so uneducated and, and we were able to evict them uh, very quickly within like two weeks. So that was our first and only eviction thus far. Uh, we probably could have worked things out on the side, but we just wanted to set the standard of, you know, we're not going to tolerate any games. Talk to us a bit more about Section 8. Tell us first, for anybody that is listening that's never heard of Section 8, what exactly is it? And then we'll dive yeah. into it a little bit deeper. Yeah, so Section 8 is um, government housing, basically subsidized housing that uh, a landlord like myself can provide the home. And then the government will step in and help out uh, paying a good majority, or in some cases, the whole portion of whatever uh, the tenant qualifies for. So the tenant would have to get qualified with the Section 8 uh, Housing Administration. And if they qualify and get approved, then depends on their income, how much they're making per month, the number of kids and so forth that will put them in either a poverty, you know, demographic or, or, or something that uh, class classifies them that they need assistance from the government. So in that case, I would be signing documents with the with Section 8. Uh, Section 8 comes through the house to inspect to make sure that it's up to code and, and qualifies for a safe environment for the family. And, um, and yeah, all three of us sign. It's basically like uh, me, the tenant, and then Section 8 signing an agreement and they, they pay like clockwork. Um, each and every month without any issues. And some of the tenants are paying like very, very little, you know, and, and it really makes it beneficial. We don't need to worry about it. Section eight is interesting because I feel like it can be a bit divisive. I feel like some investors say they absolutely hate section eight. They would never yeah. even consider it. And then there are some people who love it. You know, it sounds like you enjoy it yourself. There's, I know I've talked to other people who really, really like it as well. So it's really interesting that there's this divide between some investors really like it and some don't. What yeah. have been some of the upsides for you for renting to Section 8? Yeah. So with Section 8, um, I grew up on Section 8, honestly. So I, I grew up uh, getting a lot of, we grew up like American poor, right? Like, uh, there's all these other countries that their level of poor is like a whole different level. So we are above and beyond blessed, but still grew up with the government stepping in and helping out and local churches and, and uh, my local school helping out as much as they could. Um, but yeah, I mean, bottom line is that I think if you get the right tenant in there, then they're going to treat the home as if it's theirs. They're not going to trash it. Um, and this, this goes across the board with any type of tenants. Right. Um, but you know, if, if the, the awesome part behind it is that the government is paying it each month. So whether they work or not, you know, they, they're going to step in and really be more of the authority figure over these tenants because they do an annual inspection. Um, if, if they find out anything about the, the tenants that they're doing that are breaking the lease, they step in before I even do. So it, it's, it's uh, beneficial in that way that you don't need to worry like, hey, is this tenant actually going to pay rent this month? You know, a good portion is getting paid by, by Section 8. From my limited experience with Section 8, I've seen that they actually pay pretty well for rental rates for Section 8 too. Has that been your experience? Exactly. Yeah, that's where you can really get the premium amount for your area. And it's all within their own algorithm of calculating, you know, what it's worth, but it, it's crazy. Like, and each year you can ask for an increase. So when with some of my other tenants, I've always been like hesitant or scared, like, Hey, if I increase it this much, you know, are they going to start searching around? Are they going to look for something else? 
Section eight, you can ask for the increase. It rarely um, messes with the the tenant. It can in some cases, and they they might be, you know, they might need to pay more depending on their uh, their monthly and annual income. But besides that, a lot of section eight also stay longer, which is uh, in my case just been more of a you know something that we don't need to worry about. If they stay for a long time, that's great. What have been some of the downsides, if any, to Section 8? I know you've mentioned the different inspections that Section 8 does. I've heard of some investors, yeah. not that they're they're definitely not slumlords and they're providing a good place to live, but there are sometimes, like with FHA mortgages, you know, Section yeah. 8 could have requirements that are kind of nuanced and a little bit more of a pain in the butt than they are necessarily providing a specific place that's you know safe to live so have you run into any issues with the inspections or any other downsides with section eight yeah yeah you're so correct it's uh there's definitely some nitpicking that goes on because that's that's the inspector's role to like find something and even if if they're if he constantly has nothing that he's criticizing the landlords on then it looks like he's not doing his job so it, it's really a weird concept. Um, some, sometimes it's like the most ridiculous things, but in all of our situations, all of our cases, it's always been less than a couple hundred bucks, if any, to actually do whatever they say to make it uh, qualified. And it's always been a great relationship that the guy has always just told us like, hey, after you install this or do this, then just take a picture of it, send it to me and I'll approve it and let section eight know. So it's really not that bad. If they ever nitpicked about the stupidest things and really decided to be a pain and make it like thousands of dollars and we didn't see that it was like justified, then I'd probably just say, no, I'm not going to do this. And then, you know, keep it moving uh, outside of section eight. But we, we do the burst strategy on all of our properties. So all of our properties are like fully remodeled and in pretty good condition uh, for the most part. You touched on something that's important is that if it ends up not working with section eight, you could just rent it to a normal tenant. It's not like you're yeah. section eight or, or nothing, right? It's, you can yeah. rent it to a normal tenant as well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. When you do go about section eight housing, if somebody's listening and they're interested in this strategy, do you have to... Talk to us a little bit about how it works in terms of like actually getting started. Do you have to designate a house as like Section 8 housing available or do somebody who is Section 8 approved already come to you and say, hey, I want to rent this place, but I am Section 8. Like, how does that work? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, first off, just, you know, I let my I, I reached out to Section 8. I let them know that I'm a landlord, you know, uh, with many properties in the area. Um, they asked me for the list of my vacant properties, and then they basically put my name and my number, my contact info on a list of theirs of local landlords that have properties available. So when people that are just approved for Section 8 and they're looking for a home, um, they'll see that list and yeah, they'll, they'll give me a call. Um, and I always make them go through our application first, just to make sure that they qualify with me and that it is a good fit at the end of the day. Everybody has to go through the same procedures. Um, but then after they are pre-approved, then, you know, then it starts off with uh, Section 8, making sure that their paperwork is good with them. And then the inspection comes through. Uh, and then about a week later, you know, we're good to go signing leases. How do you screen Section 8 housing applicants or tenants, because one of the most important things that I look for as a landlord is income, specifically yeah. three times the rent for yep. a tenant. So that's probably not going to be the case with Section 8, right? If they make enough money to be three times the rent, they're probably not going to qualify for Section 8 housing. So how, what are you looking for in a Section 8 tenant's application or just overall profile that you use to screen them? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I, I screen everybody exactly the same. Uh, when it comes down to a Section 8 and their income, it's going to be slightly different, but I still want to see consistency for at least three months. Um, ideally, I love to see consistency for at least a year. I do not like when I see people jumping from jobs. Um, it's just inconsistent. It's unstable. And they could do that. They could break the lease, in my opinion. You know, So 
I like to stay away from that. But if when it comes down to their income, I know Section 8 will pay a big portion of it. So I'm just concerned on on their financial side of whatever they are responsible for. And I can check in with Section 8 to, to find out what that is. Um, then they make at least three times that amount, ideally more. Um, but, you know, three times the amount is, is what we're okay with. You mentioned breaking the lease. And that's actually an interesting <laughs> thing I want to talk about because, again, I have a very limited understanding or experience with Section 8, but I do, I have looked into a little bit of research a little bit. I almost bought a, a house that was going to be Section 8. But from my understanding, is that if somebody has a lease that's Section 8, for a year, if they try to break the lease early, they're not going to get assistance from Section 8 with their next house. So Section 8 continue to pay you as the landlord for the lease of the length of that lease. Whereas, and then if they go somewhere else, they technically could go live somewhere else, but they have to pay that rent themselves. Is that kind of what your experience has been? Is that accurate? Uh, to a certain degree. So um, if like you mentioned in the first part of that, uh, if they break the lease, then section they, they are no longer um, approved and good to go with Section 8 anymore. If they get evicted, they lose their Section 8 voucher. So they're going to be screwed on rent. Um, they, they're going to have to figure it out on their own. So that's another very huge positive uh, sign right there because they are living off of that. They're getting a huge handout and hookup. So they don't want to lose that. Therefore, they'll do many things to make sure that, you know, um, they're in good status. Um, on the flip side of that, though, if they did break the lease and they're not living there anymore, Section 8 won't pay. Um, they're not going to, that they're going to break the lease um, and, and that's it. So I would have to, at that point, uh, go to sue um, that individual. So if you had a house that could be rented, let's just keep everything else the same. If you had a tenant that applied Section 8 or just traditional tenant, which would you prefer? I would actually prefer um, if if it's apples to apples, good people and uh, and no issues when it comes down to that, then I would 100% prefer Section 8. And the, the three reasons are that they typically stay longer, um, which is nice. I don't need to worry about vacancies. You know, that's that's what kills us, vacancies. Um, also, the, the top dollar rent and getting that increase each and every year. And then also them just going above and beyond to make sure that they're in good status with Section 8, as well as me as the landlord, so that they don't get kicked out so that they don't lose their voucher. As somebody who invests long distance, probably the number one question that I get asked is how do you manage your long distance properties? How are you doing? Yeah. I used to get this all the time. Like, so how do you unclog the toilet for your tenants in the middle of the night? I'm like, you do that for your tenants? Like, I don't, like, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would do that for myself in the middle of the night or for like my lady, you know, like, I, I just think it's, uh, it's funny. It, it comes down to systems. Um, and I'm very, very blessed and thankful that uh, we started off doing this long distance, 3,000 miles away, because I'm the type of person that uh, very, uh, I would say a little bit of controlling of like, you know, if, if it's not getting done the right way and it's close by, I would probably be over there on a regular basis and like stepping in, getting more uh, hands on instead of like working on the business, I'd be working in the business and that's like, that's not going to be beneficial. So um, thankfully it was long distance and uh, it really just came down to the relationships, like relationships, 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 and building them up. We have an amazing uh, contractor that really is my everything over there. He, he does the full renovations. He does, he shows tenants properties uh, after they're pre-approved. Um, he handles keys, maintenance issues, anything and everything. So he's my boots on ground and my, basically my property management, but also um, my contractor. And um, I, I've tried getting uh, property management companies in the past over there, but they're all like criminals and just like, 
uh, you know, nobody's going to care about your investment more than yourself. So this, this guy has been a gem for me and that secret, like little sauce, that little ingredient that has blessed our business. If anybody listening listened to an episode a couple of weeks ago where I talked about my long distance investing, it's, you're probably laughing like I am because this is literally almost exactly what I said when he really? mentioned, when Brendan mentioned about the toilets. I'm the exact same way as I own a duplex that I live in and I house hack. Even if the unit next to me broke, I don't know how to fix it. So it's not like I could do it. <laughs> I have to call a professional to go fix it for me. And so it's the same when I invest long distance, I call a professional that's able to do it for me and they go handle it. It's, it's, I think people make it more complex than it really has to be. Exactly. It's so true. What does your portfolio look like today? How many houses or properties or units do you have, I guess, across the board, but in Ohio specifically as well? Yeah. So we are uh, in the low twenties right now. Um, we have uh, over a dozen, like 15 over in Ohio. And then out here in San Diego, the last, um, the last year and a half, two years, I guess we've been taking more territory and focusing more out here. Um, just because we finally got to the certain experience or confidence or whatever you want to call it, education that we were making the birth strategy work out here on million dollar plus properties. And at first it was scary raising that money or utilizing our credit to be able to do so. Um, But it's been so rewarding. We're doing Airbnb and a lot of our properties out here, but still having, you know, after we renovate it, have no money into it with the cash out refinance. And out here, it's like, you should never bet on appreciation. But let me tell you, man, it's like, it really increases out here in San Diego. One of our properties, a fourplex, uh, just last year in one year's time frame, increased over three hundred thousand dollars, and it's like, and and it's already fully renovated. It's like we already got all of our money out, but now I can take out extra money from that, and it's a cash cow because of Airbnb, and it's just like, man, there's so many benefits to being local and and uh, and having fun with a different type of quality of a product. At the end, it's not like uh, Ohio rental. It's it's a little bit classier, um, but it's nice. Hey everyone, Clay Fink here, host of the Millennial Investing Podcast. Today, I wanted to tell you guys about this exciting new investment tool called Titan. Titan is an investment platform for everyday investors that want their money actively managed by a team of experienced analysts. With how hectic life can get at times, why not outsource your investments to the experts? They offer three equity portfolios and America's very first actively managed crypto portfolio. Their funds have continually beaten the market since inception, and they aim to grow your investments by 15 percent annually. At this rate, this would imply your money doubling every five years. My favorite fund is their flagship fund, which invests in the highest quality large cap growth stocks in the U.S. Join the smarter way to invest with Titan. All it takes is $100 to get started. Right now, if you sign up through our link, titan.com slash TIP, you'll get your first three months of investment management for zero fees. That's titan.com slash TIP for zero fees. We're going to dive into the birth strategy a bit deeper in a little bit, but before we do, I want to talk about credit and then we'll tie credit together with the birth strategy. Yeah. As part of your intro, you mentioned that you're a credit expert. You've done a bunch of stuff with credit. You have credit hacks. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that mean? And are you talking about credit as in credit card or mortgages or what kind of credit exactly does it mean? Yeah. Uh, Really anything credit related. But um, with that being said, just to make it simple, is uh, mostly credit cards. Uh, We look at credit as like a four-step process. So it's educate, fix, build, and leverage in that order. So it's very important to be educated, you know, when you're jumping into this credit game of like uh, how the banks and lenders are judging us, how the bureaus are judging us, how to play the game of credit. Afterwards, we could all use a little bit of fixing because the bottom line is they weren't teaching it in school. And, um, and there's a lot of things that we've done mistakenly or even just too much info on our credit profiles. And the credit bureaus are screwing up a lot of things as well. So there's a lot of mistakes on our credit profiles that need some fixing and cleaning. So we can show people within hours up to 10 business days how to remove and fix stuff that have been holding them back for way too long. Um, bankruptcies removed in like 30 days. It's crazy. 
And then um, afterwards, building. Building is my favorite. That's what I am very passionate about. We can show you how to get from 700 to the 800 club in less than 30 days. Uh, FICO score, and then doing a mass apply, meaning in the right order, applying for 10, 20, 30, 40 plus credit cards at once, removing all the hard inquiries afterwards, obviously, but, uh, um, but getting, you know, 300,000 in credit lines and, uh, and even a million plus on the business side of credit within one year. So once you have all the credit, all the funding in the world, then it's time to leverage it and put it to work. And we are passionate about real estate, but um, whatever you're passionate about, really, you can utilize those funds to put to work and and uh, compound it. Some people listening to the show may not know that business credit even exists. Most people are familiar with personal credit scores and credit reports, but not as many are familiar with business. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about the difference between business credit and personal credit, and then explain to us how we can actually build business credit. Yeah. So building business credit, it's um, it's something I'm very passionate about because literally 90% of businesses and companies, even people teaching it nationwide, are, are doing it incorrectly or they're missing some, some really like of the secret sauce that separates from getting you know fifty to hundred thousand versus getting a million plus, so it's that's a big difference, you know. Um, but yeah, to to just break down business credit, if you're doing anything that is a business, treat it like a business. This is one of my biggest regrets when it comes down to credit as a whole. I didn't jump into I, I leveraged my personal credit for a long time and build up huge credit lines on the personal side versus the business. Business, nine times out of 10, that credit won't actually show up on your personal. Therefore, it's separated and it's not going to fluctuate your score. It's not going to drop down you know, your, your score from having a high utilization and so forth. So um, even if you personally guarantee it, it you, know, you might get a hard inquiry, but uh, we can show you how to remove that quickly. And then it will never actually pop up on your, your personal side unless you're delinquent. Now, there are certain cards um, that are business, but will still actually pop up underneath your personal. So you want to be mindful of certain things like that, such as like the business discover card or business uh, capital one and so forth. But, but overall, um, you can get a lot more credit, like huge credit lines and a lot more of it on the business side. So why not? So talk to us about how we do that. How do we actually build business credit and yeah. how do we get those lines of credit? Yeah, man, you're getting the secret sauce out of me. Uh, but honestly, I'm, I'm so passionate about this stuff and just truthfully, and not, a, not enough people actually take action on this stuff. So if you guys are listening right now, understand like we, there's a, there's a huge dollar amount of value when it comes down to this. So you definitely want to take out your, your notepad and pen and write this stuff down. Um, Cause I'm going to drop some jewels for you guys right here. So you want to start off with ideally an aged entity really sets you up for more success. Now you can start off with a two year, a four year, or ideally a 10 plus that will set you up for tremendous success not 100% needed. You can still start off with a brand new one, but um, but those are just some little key ingredients to, to really set you apart from the rest. With that being said, uh, starting off with uh, the Secretary of State and then the IRS, uh, getting your EIN, um, and then your uh, DUNS number, uh, you can get a free one. Um, all of all of this information that you're going to have that you're going to be showing, like your business address, business phone number, uh, the name of the entity, everything, it all needs to be apples to apples across the board. So you want to have basically like a little spreadsheet for yourself that you can basically copy and paste everywhere. Because as you start filling out things, you're going to get confused or you're going to make some mistake that isn't apples to apples with something else in the past. And that is the most crucial thing that so many people are messing up out there. When there's inconsistencies and the bank sees that, there's red flags that go up. And they're, they're, that means that there's a higher risk on their side. So they want to see apples to apples across the board. Um, having a business phone number, not your cell phone, is important. Um, 
and uh, a, a local uh, landline is good. Um, otherwise, like a 1-800 number is good, um, but not a cell phone and not a Google uh, number, okay? Um, on top of that, your business address. Now, if you ideally, the best case scenario is having a brick and mortar office. If you have a physical location, um, that's great. Now, many entrepreneurs out there, especially small business owners that are just getting started, that's not the case. It's not even feasible. It doesn't make sense. And honestly, I mean, there's mega millionaires that are all you need is a laptop, right? Like in today's day and age. So it's not necessarily needed. And banks are starting to realize that over the last couple of years. Um, so having a home address as your business address is totally fine in about 90% uh, of, of bank case scenarios. With that being said, you still want to put a suite number or letter after your address, okay? And this is, this is a little simple, goofy part that a lot of people mess up on. If your address is uh, 123 uh, Brick Lane, you know, San Diego, California, then you would want to put 123 Brick Lane Suite, put a number or letter behind it, okay? If it's apartment, uh, number or letter, just instead of apartment, put suite and number or letter. Okay. Um, there's just small little secret sauce behind that. That actually shows more of business related to the banks that they're not going to like penalize you, if that makes sense. Um, next is really said, did you have any questions on that? No, keep going. Okay. So um, next is really setting up uh, like Google My Business. Um, just, I know that sounds weird, but you don't want to like Google your business yet. That's at the very end, but you just want to type in Google my business and create a profile right there. Uh, it's similar to like, if you were shopping or you go to Google, you know, a restaurant or a local store, it's going to be like that little profile on the side that has your picture, uh, your phone number, hours of operation, stuff like that. So, um, afterwards you're going to set up your social media, um, across the board for the business, you're going to set up uh, 411, uh, Yellow Pages, Yelp, uh, you name it. After all that, then you want to set up uh, a, a service um, that's called Moz Local. Now, you can either use Moz Local or you can jump on Fiverr and uh, look for guys that will do it super cheap to basically put your information, your business information, on about 50 plus um, websites that you've never heard of ever. But what this does is help with your SEO. So when banks go to search your business name, you're, you're popping up just you, not any other uh, companies, just you for the first two to three pages. And that's crucial because that really shows that you're accessible. You're not hiding. Like the banks can find you. You're there. Uh, you're a real legitimate business. You have reviews in certain places, you know, um, that, you know, obviously have a website and so forth, but everything needs to be apples to apples. So it aligns and it matches up. Um, afterwards, you can get a, a NAV account, uh, NAV account. It's similar to like Credit Karma for the personal side. So it's not 100% accurate. But if you get the business um, account for that, it's 50 bucks a month charged every three months, 150 bu bucks um, every three months that they, uh, they report as a trade line uh, to the three business bureaus, which is very helpful because after you know, your SEO is on point and that whole foundation process is done, a lot of our students, it takes about four to five hours to get that process done from beginning to end on the foundation. It takes about 10 days afterwards to refresh everywhere and, and really be um, found. So at that point, then you can start getting trade lines on your account. And that's, that's a whole nother conversation that kind of will go down a, a rabbit hole a little bit. But, um, but that's some real gold nuggets that if you just did that, like you would be ahead of maybe 70, 80 percent of businesses nationwide. And I'm talking big businesses as well. 
You mentioned at the very beginning, aged entity. What exactly do you mean by that? Is, are you talking about like buying an entity that already has existed for five, 10 years so that you can utilize that? Or what are you talking about there? I am. Yeah. Um, now be cautious of this. I, I probably shouldn't have even mentioned that because um, there's a lot of companies out there that are already blacklisted. Um, so you wouldn't want to buy that age corporation um, because the banks will see that it's coming from one of those companies and they won't give you any type of funding. So now it's just like a, a regular entity that's only good for protection purposes, but that could be done for as little as 100, 200 bucks of creating a brand new one, right? So you want to be mindful of getting an aged corporation that's never been used, never doesn't even have an EIN. Like you're going to get the new EIN an EIN is basically like a, uh, a tax identification uh, code. It's like your social security number, same amount of digits as well, but it's only for the business. So you'll get that with the IRS. Um, so yeah. Once you've done all these things, what are you using it for? What kind of business loans are you getting? What, kind, what types of products are they? And do you have to have a ton of revenue to qualify? Like, how are you getting qualified for these? Walk yeah. us through that a little bit. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, so there's different uh, ways that the banks will give you funding and how they judge you. You can either personally guarantee everything, meaning your personal FICO score. Um, you can give a ton of documents, uh, meaning you have, have great revenue coming in, you have great contracts, you have great tax returns that you can show, um, or you can do uh, collateral um, collateral, meaning you have other assets that you, or life insurance or something that you could put in exchange to be able to get you, you know, these fundings as a, as a secured loan. Otherwise, if you want it totally unsecured, then you really need to build out the most sexiest, strongest business credit profile. And as, as much as that's like daunting or confusing or, or think that it's very time consuming, it's really not. It, it takes about three months three to four months to actually position yourself to have enough trade lines on your account that, and that takes about two hours a month. Um, after the third, fourth month, you should have a minimum of 10 to 14 trade lines reporting on all three of the business bureaus. At that point, you're really positioned strong enough to actually go to uh, some of your local small credit unions or other banks that you have a relationship with. That's, that's another crucial part, having a strong relationship with all of these banks, like meaning the longer you've been with them, the better. So everybody that only has one or two bank accounts right now, uh, take this as a sign, get out there and open up another three to four today. You know, uh, don't, don't open more than five a month um, because check systems will come in and start red flagging you uh, as you know, they're scared, but um, it's still not going to be bad, but you should still, you know, go for no more than five a month and just create a spreadsheet so that you know when you opened it, login information, stuff like that to make it organized and easy for you. But um, at the end of the day, you know, setting, setting yourself up for success right around that third month, you can actually get, go to these banks and get lines of credit from 25,000 to 50,000 or higher. And that's just the beginning, you know, and, but you got to take these small ones so that you can start you know, you, you utilize it, you pay it off and they give you increases, you know, they just want to see good stewardship and, um, and over time within, it's just a snowball effect. You can do this with several banks, you know, and then a afterwards, months later, you're getting, you know, a hundred to 200,000 and it just snowballs. So by the end of 12 months passes around, you know, you're, you're well over uh, a million plus. What is a personal line of credit and what are the benefits of it? How does it differ from a business line of credit? Yeah. So uh, personal line of credit is just going to show up underneath your personal uh, credit profile. So it, it shows up as a revolving account, uh, meaning that, you know, there's a monthly payment due um, each, each month. They're going to calculate that into your debt to income ratio. If you are going to get a mortgage or, really any type of financing, uh, similar to auto loans and so forth. How can someone listening to the show use a personal line of credit to get six figures of funding at maybe 0% interest? 
Yeah. So I have a great story. I have a 19 year old um, that found me on YouTube several months ago. He was in the low 800 or I'm sorry, the low uh, he's in the low 800s now, but he was in the low 500s at the time when he came to me, just because when he was 18, fresh out of high school, he wasn't taught in high school how to manage his money properly, credit cards and so forth. So he, he jacked up his credit. He was in the low 500s. Um, when he came to me, he had certain goals. He wanted to fix his credit quickly, wanted to get huge credit lines and then put it to work and start leveraging it. That's what we do. So it made sense. Once, once he jumped in 10 days later, he fixed his credit completely, wiped off the debt, got uh, from low 500s to low 800 FICO score. Um, so being in the 800 club, he was able to get set himself up for success doing a mass uh, apply application sequence and doing it in the right order, you can get 90% approval rate. He actually went after almost 40 credit cards and he got every single one approved. I think he got denied closer to one or two at the end, um, but he got over 300,000 in new credit lines at age 19, not even having a job. Um, at this point, now he has a job because now he's leveraging it. He's putting it to work in real estate, e-commerce, uh, a Shopify store for clothing company that he just started. And then also he was able to buy a car, uh, his dream car, to be able to start uh, putting it on Turo and making a strong return on. So um, yeah, the, the cool part is like the, the possibilities are endless and you can do a mass apply for yourself every six months. That's what people don't realize. It's you don't want to wing it and just go out there and apply for you know a couple cards here and there. You're going it, you're going to set yourself up for failure and get denied quickly if you don't do it in the right order. There's a science behind it. And there's a lot of bank rules and everything you got to be educated on. But doing it in the right order, you can get a ridiculous amount of funding. One of the world records is. I believe it's 143 new credit cards in one year. And so, I mean, that's powerful. And his best friend ended up getting 138, you know, credit cards in that same year. So that, that tells you something about proximity and networking and like your circle, right? I didn't even realize that there were that many credit cards out there that you could even get, but isn't it yeah. a bit scary that somebody that's only 19 with no job, no income could get $300,000 in credit? I think it's, um, I think honestly, if, if, uh, if they're educated properly, um, I, I think it's, it, it's morally irresponsible. I think it's like, it should be, I, I think it's irresponsible and all the scariness out there in the world of what the bank and what the government's doing with our money today. You know, like uh, they're the worst or the best example of not like what not to do with money, with how much we're going into debt in the billions, you know, increasing each and every day. So um, what I like to show is exactly flipping the script of what the banks have been doing to us for way too long. You know, like we give our hard work money uh, to the banks. They give us 0.00% back. You know, they give us barely anything back, a little crumbs here and there. And then they resell it to us, making a fortune, 35x return or higher, uh, infinitely really, um, back to us through, through different products. You know, mortgages, personal loans, business loans, auto loans, you name it, uh, student loans. And it's, it's mind blowing. Plus they're making billions upon billions each and every year, just for the simple fact of, you know, really sticking the, the, the knife in our backs of um, late fees or overdraft fees each and every year. Like they're, they're, they're going after the poor and the uneducated. And that's, that's pathetic in my eyes. I, I think that's, that's uh, the tough part. So I'm glad to show anybody uh, you know, how to flip the script on these banks. And, and afterwards, it's like, it's important to have money management skills. It's important to be responsible with funds. Um, but I, I like some people in, in our group, when they come in, they, they stop at a hundred thousand, like they get a hundred thousand and they're just in the beginning and, I'm, and they just like, well, I don't think I need any more. And I always encourage them like, 
I know you don't need it right now, but who knows? You could in the future. And it, it's best to have all of the credit or all the money that you have accessible um, to have it there instead of not having it. So then you could potentially put it to work when the right opportunity comes around. You'll have more confidence. You'll be fearless behind it. And you can make the, the proper right decision instead of, well, now I got to go search for the money and I don't know where it's coming from. Let's combine these credit card strategies to what you're doing in real estate. First, explain to us what the Burr strategy is and then tell us how you're leveraging credit cards and how people using listening to the show might be able to use credit cards to do the same thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. So good. So I fell in love with the Burr strategy first off. So anybody out there that doesn't know this, um, definitely dive into this stuff because it can be life-changing, but the Burr strategy, it's, it's B and then four R. So buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. So what that looks like is we're buying a fully distressed property, uh, beat up from the feet up. Uh, afterwards, we're doing the full renovation on it, making it brand new again, making it look sexy in the neighborhood. At that point, it's pretty easy to get a well quality, not, it's easy to get a lot of interest in the property because it's brand new and it looks good in the neighborhood. But getting a well qualified tenant is the key to that, right? After it's rented out and it's doing well, then you can take it back to a bank and you can get a cash out refinance. So making sure that you qualify for a personal or a business mortgage, um, or there's investment type of lending out there that will, will work with you uh, based on the asset itself, the numbers, the, the property. Um, however, you will pay a higher premium when it comes down to the interest rates. If the numbers make sense, the numbers make sense. So I wouldn't overthink that part. But once you get... Um, it's really kind of like a fix and flip, except instead of just a one-time payout and that's like a high paying job, and then you got to move on to the next, you actually keep the property. And the whole goal with this is just, just to have no or little money actually remaining left out of your pocket into the deal. So ideally, you know, if you bought it for 50,000, you put 20,000 into it, it's worth a hundred thousand. You get a uh, a new mortgage at 70,000, you only had 70,000 into it. You have no money left into it. And now you have a small monthly mortgage, let's say $500. Uh, but in fact, it rents out for a thousand. Now you get the cash flow, that couple hundred dollars, uh, obviously minus your you know, vacancies, uh, capital expenditures, uh, maintenance, insurance, all that fun stuff. But um, doing this process and repeating it. That's the last step. That's where you'll get that financial freedom. You'll get that generational wealth. Um, you'll be able to compound on so many different areas of real estate that has that mailbox money that has literally been able to give us the freedom over the years and, and life-changing experience. How are you leveraging credit cards to do this? Yeah. So we've... Um, We've purchased properties with credit cards and we've completed all of our remodels with credit cards. Also have done hard money lending and private money lending with our credit into real estate for other partners. How do you purchase a property? How do you buy a house on a credit card? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's many different ways, honestly. Um, uh, you can use plastic.com. Uh, that's a technique. Uh, there's small fees involved with that, but they will wire it right into escrow. Um, otherwise, you can also... We've done manufacturer spending to be able to liquidate um, cash from our credit cards. And once the cash is in our bank, then we can use it however, which way we want. So we'll just wire it into escrow. Uh, we've had students utilize uh, merchant accounts and there's right ways to do this and wrong ways to do it. The whole uh, There's a lot of things with credit that we teach that there's there's many ways to do it there's small amount of ways to do it correctly. There's many ways to mess it up that could actually hurt you and damage your bank relationships or get your accounts closed and so forth. So that's why I'm a very big advocate of like giving out free guidance and stuff like that and, and uh, motivation behind it. It can be very life-changing and, and amazing, but there's, there's so many ways that you could screw it up. So I encourage you, don't just wing it and and try to do it on your own, like really get educated on it. Um, but yeah, we've had people uh, utilize merchant accounts and get, you know, zero uh, percent interest credit cards, swipe it on their card, and then be able to wire it into escrow. 
the plastic website you mentioned, is that ending with a Q instead of a C? It ends with a Q, yes. And talk to us a little bit about the risks. This is a very risky strategy. We've had people on the show that have talked about this in the past, but talk to us about the risks involved. I mean, fully leveraging to buy a property can be super risky, and especially with high interest debt like credit cards. So talk to us a bit about the risk and some of the downsides of using the strategy. Yeah. So I don't see any downsides with it. Um, we don't ever pay any interest. Um, so I would, I would never encourage anybody to pay uh, interest on credit cards to, to begin with. Um, it's like mafia rates. It's worse than mafia rates. You could probably get a better deal from your local mafia man. So um, just be careful on that. Uh, and that, that comes down to doing it the right way and the wrong way. Manufacturer spending, you can actually get paid to liquidate your, your credit cards. Um, like for example, I, I needed to come to the table with an extra 200,000 for a fourplex because we raised some money, but needed an, an additional 200,000 to close on a fourplex here in San Diego. Um, I had 50,000 on the line. I wasn't going to let that go. And it already went hard. Good to go. Um, so we ended up using 2% cash back credit cards. I liquidated the, the funds. I made $4,000 in a couple hours of getting $200,000 out. I made $4,000 in cash profit. Um, the 200,000 I had liquid in cash that I was able to take to closing. Later, we didn't need it. We had investors that showed up last second, good to go. So I, I just took that money and I paid back off my credit cards, but it was at 0% interest for an extra year anyway. So I could have took that 200,000 and put it into different investments. Regardless, needless to say, it, it didn't cost me anything except a couple hours of time, but I also made $4,000. You know, it's a, it's a big difference. Um, so just, just knowing your exit plan is very, very crucial into any type of investing and having, I'm a, I'm a person that a big advocate on having multiple backup plans. I made mistakes in the beginning by utilizing on the personal side, um, having the 0% interest for 12, 18 months. But I also didn't realize that my utilization would be really high. So then it makes it more difficult when you're trying to get a cash out refinance with a, a local bank, when they're like, hey, you got high utilization, man, your score dropped 100 points. Um, and, you, and you know, you're trying to convince them like, yeah, but once you, you know, once uh, I get this money from you guys, I'm going to pay off the card, you guys can pay it, but they don't look at it that way. So you got to be educated and creative to move things around to make it work. How did you liquidate the 200,000 from the credit card? Manufacturer spending. What does that mean? Manufacturer spending is a big circle basically um, of, of moving money around. I have a great video that explains it the best on my YouTube channel for Brandon Elliott Investments, but just to quickly uh, explain this, right? Um, so you take your credit card, and then you purchase, for example, uh, a Visa debit gift card. So one of these. So you purchase a Visa debit gift card. Um, afterwards, afterwards, um, you take that Visa debit gift card and you purchase, let's say, a money order. Once you get that money order, then you deposit it into a certain bank account. Once it's in the bank account and it clears a couple of days later, then you pay back off that credit card and you either make that profit or you pay it to another card that you're going to have debt on and pay interest, or you pay it into an investment property, whatever it may be. Um, but just keep in mind that for the Visa debit gift card, it's going to cost $3.95 per thousand on the gift card. Um, and then it's also going to cost like 88 cents or let's just say a dollar for the money order. So just easy, rough numbers, $4 plus the one, $5 in expenses. Let's say you're using a 3% cash back credit card to purchase these Visa debit gift cards. Okay, you following me? So you're taking, it's all about the, the, um, the volume that you do, but for easy numbers per thousand dollars that you're purchasing, it's gonna cost you $5 in expenses but it's also going to be $30 gross profits because it's a 3% cash back card. 
So $30 minus your five, you're walking away with $25 profit minus your time involved in gas to drive to these locations to make it happen, which isn't much. You know, let's take off an extra dollar per thousand. So if you're doing this in volume, let's say $100,000, then you, you know, for this example, $3,000 gross minus the $500, you're walking away with $2,500 profit. Okay. So for that example that I gave you a few minutes ago on that property, 200,000 liquidated, and we made $4,000, that was a 2% cash back card. Is there any limitation to this? Do credit card companies eventually shut you off? Like where, where does this line eventually end? Yeah. So there, there's a right way to do it. And there's a way to totally, you know, build this into a business. Like I've had people uh, I hired on in the past that were manufacturers spending for us, um, making it very profitable, very hands-off, very little time out of my end. Um, They're making several thousand. I was making 10,000 plus. Uh, so there's many ways to do this. I've manufactured spent over 17 million at this point um, in the last couple of years, but um, there's a right way to do it. There's a wrong way to do it that you could get accounts shut down for sure. Um, you know, so you want to be mindful. Uh, you want to, you want this information to be in the right hands, uh, because if it's in the wrong hands, then it could potentially be used for covering up money or, um, or money laundering to a certain degree, but no, it is not illegal. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not a bad thing to do. It's just there, there's a right way to do it. And there's a, there's several wrong ways. So you just want to be educated. What have been some of your favorite resources that you've used to learn about these types of things across your journey? You didn't wake up one day and know all of this stuff. So what are you yeah. relying on? You know, as somebody who's a teacher now before sure. that, what were you using to learn? Yeah. So, um, you know, honestly, there's a lot of great stuff on like Reddit. There's a lot of great stuff. There's a platform, uh, uscreditcardguide.com that can give a lot of data points and a lot of good information on any type of credit cards. Not, not all credit cards, you know, but um, a lot of the mainstream ones. Um, on top of that, there are... Um, there's credit boards out there, which is another great platform to do your due diligence on data points for uh, credit related stuff, like what your FICO should be for this card or, you know, where one individual applied for and they got denied or got approved, how much they said they made annually, which bureau they pulled from, you know, all these things have a lot of power behind it when you get this information and then you put these cards in the right order. Um, a lot of my learning was like trial and error along the way as well and pushing things to see if it works and see if it doesn't. And um, so a lot of things have come back to smack me in the face. Um, but that's why it's, it's very rewarding to teach people now because I see them doing it the right way. And even the ones that are stubborn, like myself in the past or something, you know, they uh, as long as I can step in and, and stop them from making any little small mistakes, uh, they can see the blessings from it and the compound that it makes in not just their lives, but their circle of influence, their family, their, their friends, and then within their business over such a short time frame, it's, it's really remarkable. Before we give a handoff to where people can find you, I always wrap up the show by turning the tables and letting the guest ask me a question. So Brandon, what question do you have for me? That's so good. I love it. Um, what are you doing with your credit? So I'm not doing much in terms of like creative stuff. I have about eight credit cards or so. I think I have like $150,000 in good uh, available credit to me. I don't have any credit card balances, never paid any interest or anything like that. So yeah, I think I have about eight credit cards or so. I have a couple business credit cards because of the uh, businesses I have, but yeah, about 150,000 or so in available credit, but I've never done anything creative really in terms of like utilizing it for real estate or anything like that. I've more or less just used it for like sign up bonuses, but only if like, I let's just say I had my auto insurance coming up and I knew that was going to be a thousand dollars and I knew I only needed to spend a thousand dollars to get a $500 bonus or something on a credit card. I would do that. But that was about the extent to how creative I've gotten with credit cards. Yeah. 
I love it. And, and that's a nationwide thing. A lot of people pay more in cash or just take advantage of some of the sign up bonuses. So it's, uh, it's very common to hear. Um, I, I would just challenge everybody that's listening and, and even possibly yourself, Robert, that, you know, when you're educated on the credit and all the possibilities behind it, it's really endless. If, if money was ever the issue in your business or your life of, you know, I need more of it so that I can do this, 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 um, you could really flip that script pretty easily by focusing on real estate or focusing on credit. Um, and then whatever avenue, I know we're all very passionate about real estate. It's changed our lives, but credit can help, you know, exponentially take it to the next level. Yeah. I have to admit, I'm not sure how I feel about it. I think it's really interesting. It, I'm <laughs> super fascinated by it. I'm going to definitely do some research. Yeah. I'm not sure yet how I feel about it yet. I got I to gotta do a little more digging and, and get educated myself because I don't think I could formulate an opinion and say whether it's good or bad before I know enough about it. So yeah, it's, it's been really interesting to hear from you and all your different strategies that you got going on. And anybody that's interested, do, do your own research and check it out and see what your thoughts are. For anybody that wants to look into you a little bit more and, and connect with you, where's the best place for them to find them? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, once again, I, I appreciate you so much for sharing your platform with me. Uh, yeah, just had a great time today. So um, anybody that is interested in learning more about the credit side and really just getting educated, we we just did a recent webinar. There's no like upsell or any pitch on there. It's simply just education on like all the possibilities. And, uh, and that you can check out. I do encourage it um, just so you can really see what's possible with credit. But uh, on that end, um, that is on creditcounselelite.com. And it's going to be just that first little box in green that says, you know, learn more. Um, but, but yeah, you can watch the video on that. Um, otherwise, if you wanted to connect with me um, for, you know, on Instagram, it's Brandon Elliott Investments. Otherwise, facebook.com forward slash Brandon Elliott Investor. Or if you just totally want like a done for you service and possibly need to just like credit repair done, then you can always reach out to us. Uh, you can check out creditrepairmobile.com or just DM me, reach out anywhere. And uh, we'd love to bless you guys. I'll be sure to put a link to Brandon's resources in the show notes for anybody that's interested in checking them out. Brandon, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, appreciate you, Robert. Have fun today, guys. Stay blessed. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.